Hello, everybody. My name is John Sino. I am an art professor. I teach both uh, art studio classes and art history classes, and I've spent the entire most of my entire life as an adult in and around thinking about art. So I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time um, thinking and considering various works of art. And the the concept of this learning to look is partially based on the uh, one of the courses I do in art appreciation, but it's also uh, some personal um, uh, personal perceptions that I've made over the years that I like to include in in these talks. Some of you have uh, been at some of the other talks uh, I've had before, so you know that digression is, is the greater part of valor as far as I'm concerned, and you might end up finding yourself going somewhere else along the way. Well, anyway, if you were with us last week, the first thing I would like to do is apologize for all the technical glitches we had. And uh, we spent a lot of time trying to hammer those things out, and I think we've got them. So uh, having said that, we'll get right into it now. Last week, we looked at art in a different way that we're intending to this time. Last week, we looked at art by examining the symbols that we saw in it. And um, this was a sample of one of the works we saw. It, uh, it's called The Wheel of Fortune by Audrey Flack. And we saw a bunch of dis different types of groups of uh, objects that had uh, similar um, symbolic meaning, like things that discussed the passage of time, things that discussed the you know, various reflections of a person, and things that re, uh, reflected an idea of beautification, things that reflected chance. So all of these things we spun together into an idea of what this work might be showing us. And I had always thought of this work as a woman, and I'm sorry, most of you are women there, and I'm not, but I've known many in my time. And I see this as being a piece that is based on a woman who is struggling with the idea that the aging process is happening and that she has to put energy into maintaining her youthful appearance and she's wondering about you know how long that process is going to go on for right so this is an example of looking at a work and examining the images in it we looked at some other works in the last class so we looked at some other works from other parts of the world where symbolism might have a, a different meaning. In this work, Watching the Deer, uh, we see some, uh, some a noble person and his servant overlooking the water and especially theoretically looking at the deer. But what really we see here happening is a work in which a large portion of this painting is devoted to emptiness, right? Which is a concept that um, is very hard for the Western mind to wrap its head around. But the uh, the um, the Asian people had had believed it was a place of potential, and therefore was a very important element. So, this work we see a kind of uh, uh, a active balance between um, nothingness and fullness, right? So um, that's kind of um, that's kind of an idea that we're going to come back to in the next talk. One other work we looked at, um, uh, Target with Four Faces by Jasper Johns. Uh, here we see um, the main symbol is a target, something for us to aim at, right? We're supposed to look deeply into this target. And then we notice above that there are four faces that aren't able to look at the target. When we discussed this in the last class, I brought up the fact that this target, 1955, represented what was at that point the American dream. And Jasper Johns was showing us that not everybody had access to that American dream. So now with this in mind, and four blinded, blindfolded faces, I'm going to ask everybody to do me a favor. 
right? I'm going to ask from where you are, and I can see some of you, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes because I want to paint a mental picture for you. And you need to have your eyes closed for this to be effective. So now I'm going to wait for a moment for everybody to close their eyes. I'm looking, and I'm looking. Do I see eyes closed? Okay. Now, I want you to think of an image. The image I'm thinking of is one that is very familiar to all of you. I'm thinking of a, a famous painting, and as soon as I say it, it's going to pop into your head, and you're going to see it, no problem. I'm thinking of The Last Supper. So fix that idea in your head because now I'm going to show you that and we're going to see if that is similar to uh, similar to the idea that you have in your head right now. Are you ready? Wait a second. Here it comes. The Last Supper. Open your eyes. Now, how many of you thought that you would be seeing this image when you were when you were asked to think of the Last Supper? Right here is the Last Supper that was created only 110 years ago, uh, some 400. In 20 years after Leonardo's, which I'm sure is the idea that you had in your head. Well, clearly, Emil Nolde is thinking the Last Supper means something quite different that Leonardo does. So now, maybe we'll take a look and see if we can see the Last Supper. Up. Oh. It's not the Last Supper yet. It's not the image that you had in your head. This is one of my all-time favorite Last Suppers. Um, I feel like somehow or other, the Jesus and the disciples got themselves into a Greek diner. And uh, they're sitting there having the Last Supper in this Greek diner. So anyway, uh, I keep on getting a message that there's participants coming. So excuse me. Uh, there's no one there. Okay. So, anyway, as you can see, not everybody pictures the Last Supper in the same way. Okay, well, enough of that. We're going to check out the real Last Supper. Or, anyway, Leonardo's Last Supper. And... There we go. Leonardo's Last Supper. Okay, so this is the Last Supper that everybody's familiar with, and it certainly wasn't completed in 1998. I have to check with my editor on that. It was created between 1495 and 1498, right? And um, Le Leonardo um, made this painting over a number of years because Leonardo was a highly distracted type of person. Uh, we think of Leonardo and his genius, but one of the things about his genius was that it sent him from one thing to another without finishing anything often. So he left and came back and left and came back many times while working on this painting. The other thing about this painting and Leonardo that we should know is that his genius sent him often to thinking and experimenting in all sorts of new ways. So here he is making a fresco on a wall in, in, a, in, a, in a church in uh, Florence, not Florence, Milan, I'm sorry. Right? And uh, he's seen the recent uh, new technology that's come from Northern Europe oil painting. And the colors of oil is really so much richer than the colors that he could get out of fresco. And, you know, people have been experimenting with oil painting and doing lots of great things on canvases with it. So Leonardo has this idea, ha, I'm going to use oil paint in a mural. Right? And that was his plan. Right? The problem that came almost immediately was oil and water don't mix and fresco is, uses damp plaster. So he was painting oil on damp plaster and unfortunately, as soon as he finished making it, pieces were popping off of it. Right? And so this is, this is a close up of what, what we actually see. Uh, this is what, uh, backing up a little bit. 
Here it is with some people taking pictures of it. And you can see that it spans the width of the room. The room was the uh, cafeteria for the holy people in this church in, in Milan. And uh, the room itself has suffered significant damage. This room was um, being in Milan and Milan being an industrial city in Italy, it was a target of uh, bombings by the Allies during World War II. So the the holy people in this building, fearing that it uh, that damage could come to the Last Supper, packed the entire wall inside and outside with sandbags until this th there was literally a mountain surrounding the Last Supper. And indeed, the building did suffer uh, damage, and uh, parts of the room that uh, surround this were were broken and you can see where the plaster has fallen off the wall. And um, the room for many years was, uh, was exposed to the weather. So the damage of the original work by Leonardo and the damage that came over the years to it caused this painting to suffer greatly. Now we do know um, a lot about this painting. Uh, by um, every time I pause, I'm, excuse me, there's someone else coming in. We know a lot about this painting from another painting that was made. By uh, Leonardo's assistant, right? And here, uh, painting oil on canvas, Leonardo's assistant was able to, to essentially copy uh, uh, the uh, the original Last Supper in a way that holds up all of the detail. So thankfully, this this work was made and is a reference for much of what we cannot see in the Last Supper. So um, we've been looking a little bit historically at the Last Supper, and now let's get back to that that um, that painting. Oop. Oh no, it's a different Last Supper. Huh. I keep on, I, these other Last Suppers keep on finding their way into this talk, I'm sorry. Well, here, this Last Supper, which is in Venice, um, uh, looks very, very different again. And between this work and Leonardo's Last Supper, I want to examine the differences between them and see if we can glean some ideas of what the artist's intention was in making them by looking at the, the difference in the form between each one. So let's go ahead and put them up in a way that we can compare them. Not quite as big, I'm sorry, but we have them both in front of us here. And you can see quite clearly that uh, Tintoretto in 1590, and I'm sorry, there's also another typo, uh, some old slides slip in without being corrected. Uh, this one has... Uh, 1506, but it's actually 1498 that it was finished. So it was essentially um, between 90 and 100 years later that Tintoro Tintoretto painted this um, version of The Last Supper. Very different. Why? Why did they want to depict The Last Supper so differently? Right? What are they trying to tell us? And this is where the form that a work takes affects the way we get information from it. So let's look at the variations in the form between these two works and a little bit more closely. First, we can see when we, when we, um, when we divide the paintings in half, Leonardo's painting is virtually symmetric, right? The entire room, Jesus, the, um, the distribution of, of the apostles is completely symmetric. The only variation comes in the detail of the activities of the, of the um, apostles, right? So it's a highly symmetric work, right? Compare that to Tintoretto's work on the right, and we see that, oh, most of the action is happening all on the left. Most of what we would think is the important action. Jesus is looking to the left. Most of his uh, apostles are left of him. They're all glowing, while on the right, we see a bunch of people who don't seem to be as important. They don't have glowing halos around them. They seem to be um, uh, service staff 
all there to assist in this Last Supper. Another thing that we notice about these two works is the positioning of the table. Leonardo's last ta uh, table is, is set on a horizontal, and we, the audience, are in front of that horizontal, separated from the action by the table. So the table sets up as a barrier between us and the action, right? And it presents a quite a balanced straight line, whereas Tintoretto's Last Supper, where are you when you're looking at this painting, right? You seem to be up in the rafters. You know, no one is actually, you know, a place no one would normally be. You're up in the rafters, rafters you're as high as the lamp, you're in the corner, you're looking down, you're looking through your, Scott, your spy cam at this work, right? Almost as if you're, you're, you, you don't belong there, right? You're spying in, whereas Leonardo's work happens almost as if it's on a stage and we're in the audience looking at it. Very important distinctions that are being made between these two works. What else can we say about them? Well, um, Leonardo's painting, although we can't see much of the detail of it because of the damage, is filled with daylight. It's evenly lit. There's a room with lots of windows and the light is pouring into it. We know it's the daytime. We know that light permeates the space. When we look at Tintoretto's, light has a very different role. There are only two major sources of light. The lamp above, which lights a whole bunch of angels, and Jesus' um, halo, which lights the area around him. There are also some secondary halos around the, uh, the other holy people in here. The type of lighting that we have here differs from da Vinci's. Da Vinci's light reveals everything, right? Daylight lets us see all parts of the room and everything is open to us. Whereas Tintoretto's light um, is very stingy. It only shows up on a, a few things, creates areas of deep darkness and deep and, and bright light. We get this uh, very bright contrast between these two works, right? Uh, between these light and the dark rather in this work, right? Well, there are great contrasts between these two works. So um, this kind of high contrast is a way of um, creating more drama in the work. What else do we have? Well, if you look behind Jesus and Leonardo's work, um, and if you were to be able to see very carefully, you'd be able to look out a window. And behind, through that window, you see a landscape. And it essentially goes way off to the horizon. So you're looking deep, deep into space. Right? In Leonardo's work, space is infinite. Right? When you look at Tintoretto's work, if you're very careful, you can see um, right back here, the furthest corner of the room. Right? It's not very far away. Everything is crowded into a tight space. So in one, we have a, 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 an image bathed in light and clarity that is infinite. Right? In the other, we see this one that has high contrast of dark and light and uh, is very crowded. Let's see what else we have here. Okay, so I mentioned this already before. From one, you're looking from the front. The other, you're looking from the rafters. We see the depiction of the Last Supper is so very different in these two works. And now we have to wonder, why in the world did Tintoretto decide that the Last Supper should not look like Leonardo's? Certainly other people were copying this type of work. Why did Tintoretto want to do something very different? Well, a little bit of history might come in handy there. Leonardo's Last Supper, not 1501 but 1498 um, was created at a time when the Christian religion in Europe was the dominating factor in, in the political scene, right? And in everybody's lives. Um, some 
30 years later or 20 years later even begins the Protestant Reformation. And there is the schism in Christianity. Northern, Northern Europe is, is, becomes Protestant. Uh, Italy essentially is the seat of the Pope and remains now Catholic, right? So we have this, this new thing that happened that, that has changed the way people think about Christianity when we get to Tintoretto's work. Now let's go back and look at da Vinci's work for a moment and, and put together all of the pieces we have and what it might be telling us. So here we see Jesus balanced in the center, equal weight on either side of him, light going on, um, and we're imagining eternity or infinity uh, around this work, but it's set up on a table that's essentially a theater setting, a stage, and we are on the outside. It reminds us uh, the other side. It reminds us a lot like the rite that, that ha was practiced from this Last Supper. The Last Supper being the first of a uh, of a ritual meal that was celebrated between Jesus and his disciples that is repeated over and over again. Trying to let people in. Okay. Leonardo is telling us, and indeed this is in a, in, a, uh, in a room where holy people are eating on a regular basis, and they are reminded of this, is that by participating in this ritual, right, that is uh, shown in the Last Supper, that people would do weekly or daily in some cases, by participating in this ritual, your life will have stable, uh, will be stable and balanced, be calm, right? In a world that may have lots of ups and downs, um, Leonardo is offering us a, a Last Supper, a symbol of Christianity that if we accept and we participate in, is going to anchor our life, right? But not so with Tintoretto. In Tintoretto's, there is no anchoring going on here. You have to imagine Leonardo, uh, rather, Jesus in Leonardo's is the fulcrum of a seesaw and everything is balanced. But when you look at uh, Tintoretto's and imagine that seesaw, well, a whole bunch of people just sat on one side and if you were on the other side of this, you would be popping into the air. There's, there's so much of a sense of topsy-turviness in this work that it cannot offer any sense of stability, right? So why? What is he telling us here? Well, the, it's the difference in the time frame. Leonardo's work is eternal. You can come back to it. The story is repeated over and over again in, rich, in ritual. But there's another aspect of this story, that in the time of Christ, a historical event happened in which he shared a meal with his disciples. And that time, that event actually changed the course of history. It was a pivot, a turning point in history. So where Leonardo is giving us a sense of timelessness, of eternity and balance, Tintoretto is giving us an image of that same Last Supper as being a pivot point in history. Well, you know, we can see the differences between these two works. And um, I'm going to show you some other works that, that uh, follow the same kind of uh, design pattern. First, I want to show you, sometimes this new technique doesn't allow for me to move forward as easily. You have to hit it just right. Okay, that's not where I want it to be. Go one more. Okay, here we are. So uh, Leonardo's uh, composition was one that was not really original with him, but he refined it greatly. And so we're going to look at, uh, at first, 10 years later, Raphael creates this other work in which you see the important people in the center surrounded by their, you know, their disciples, if you will, in this case, fellow students or students and faculty 
Uh, but also they are surrounded by the sky off in the distance and they're set in this architectural setting, right? This is Raphael's school at Athens and it really becomes the ultimate depiction of the high Renaissance, right? So uh, Raphael was very much aware of Leonardo when he made this painting just 10 years later. But before Leonardo, there was Masaccio. And Masaccio is giving us the Holy Trinity in 1425. Masaccio is thought of as the first artist to use actual one point perspective in a painting. And when you look at this painting, Right. What do we see? The principal characters are set in an apse that doesn't go on forever, but they're set in a sacred space and they're surrounded by other people. First, um, Mary and, and, and uh, Joseph, and then beneath that, the patrons who paid for this painting uh, to be built, in, uh, painted in Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Right. So this is almost like a, a archetype for Italian painters now. The idea of the symmetrical composition set in architecture, focusing in on the, on the central figures. And Leonardo adapts that work for his painting. Okay. So, so if we go back for just one second and a reminder of the last time we talked, you notice that the skeleton is on the bottom reminding us that everybody's ultimate end is the same. Okay. Well, um, not all artists, and here we're moving ahead some decades past Leonardo, um, another religious scene, and we see the, if you follow the, the, uh, the line created by all of these people in here, um, it, it's a diagonal again. And what is where the most important thing should be, we find some empty space. In Venice, in the later part of the 1500s, there was a lot of, of um, experimentation with new new types of, of compositions, which would lead to Tintoretto's just shortly after Tintoretto being a student of Titian. Moving ahead. At the same time as that was being painted, you know, uh, there's another painting that uses in Venice that uses the same sense of the holy, the most important person in the center and all of the things that we looked at before said in architecture, Paolo Varanese painted a Last Supper, which this was originally meant to be. Right? And he was now giving us the classic composition of, of, of Da Vinci, but he added even more characters than Da Vinci did. And some of them, um, beggars and dwarfs and animals, all of these things seem to, in 1573, seem to be sacrilegious, right? And Paolo Veronese was on the verge of excommunication, right? Where in this, this, uh, this post uh, schism period, and we're into the 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 the, the, the this the uh, reaction that the Catholics were making to maintain their position, right? And and um, when he was brought he was brought before a committee to, to discuss whether this work was sacrilegious or not with the fear that if it was found so, Varanese would be excommunicated, right? So um, he had a different solution. His solution was, well, we just take off the name The Last Supper from this painting and put in another name, The Feast of the House of Levy, right? And all of a sudden, Jesus is there in a, a scene that is meant to be uh, have a lot of commotion, and therefore everybody accepted this painting, right? So much for, for uh, sticking to his guns, right? But uh, he still had the painting to show for it. Let's see. So these paintings that we're looking at in the late 1500s would be precursors to some even greater experimentation that starts around 1600 in composition. And uh, that brings us to what we call the Baroque era, which we usually date at 1600, but you can already see that a lot of the later 1500s paintings were, were developing these types of concepts as well too. 
<coughs> okay. So this is a work by Caravaggio, who's a character in himself that uh, you could talk a lot about. He was well, one of the most famous painters in Italy of his day, and he got many, many religious, um, uh, 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 there you go, I lost the word. He got paid a lot of money to make religious paintings, <laughs> commissions, right? But he himself was far from being religious. He was a swashbuckler and uh, ended up having to run away after a duel and went down to Sicily to escape um, to escape justice. Right? So, um, but anyway, he did introduce some new compositional devices. And when you look at St. Paul at the, in this image over here, on the ground, what what he's trying to show us is the moment in which Saul becomes Saint Paul. Right, he falls off his horse and he has a flash, and all of a sudden, the idea of being the general who's going to judge Christians, he has this awakening, and he becomes Saint Paul. And where does this happen? It happens right at our feet with this new type of spatial uh, uh, concept that that Caravaggio um, introduces. He also uses this very intense light, right? This uh, light and darkness that he called tenebrism. It's almost like the edges of his shapes are vibrating. And that's where the term tenebrism comes from. So Caravaggio started an entire school of painting. And one of the artists who belonged to that school was the father of Artemisia Gentilici, right? And the father of Artemisia taught the daughter how to paint. Right? It, it's not a regular thing to find women painters at this time because uh, you would have to let your daughter live in the painter's house and be his servant, essentially. And if you were of any high class, you would not want that to happen to your daughter. Right? But because he was already a painter himself, he could, he could be the mentor of, of uh, his daughter who painted this painting. Right, her story is a very exciting one, or it's you know it's filled with tragedy as well too. When she was, when her father was on a commission, he had left a good friend of his to mind his daughter, and he unfortunately minded her the wrong way, and she ended up suing him, uh, and there was a trial, and of course she did not prevail in the trial, right? But it sent her on a path of making paintings of heroic women, which we see here in Judith and the Maidservant. So Judith is, this is a biblical story, and Judith is the hero of her community by, um, by disrupting the activity of a warring group who is about to attack. And the way she did it was plying their leader with alcohol. And he was thinking he was going to be able to get seduce this young lady. And in the end, he she cut his head off. And so she ended up being the hero. But what we see in this work, besides the very um, bright uh, and a strong contrast of tenebrism, we see a diagonal composition, right? Um, and that takes us all the way back to Tintoretto and the idea that a diagonal composition is filled with energy, it's filled with action and marks a turning point many times. So those are some of the things we see when we look at this work. You know, we looked at a lot of paintings and I just wanted to you know, I'm a sculptor myself, and we never really get as much um, airtime as, as the painters. So I wanted to make a comparison between these two works before we moved on, right? So here you see a very famous version of David uh, by Michelangelo, created in 1504, his second major work after the Pieta, and quite a um, monumental work at 14 feet tall. Right? And Bernini, a hundred or so years later, with his version of David, right? Not quite as big, but definitely full of action. Right? So what is the difference that we see here? Michelangelo's David is upright and relaxed. All of the energy in this work is brought to the gaze, right? That he is looking at his enemy. And 
in the end, what we're seeing is a man who is engaged in thought, right? Which was a main idea of the high Renaissance and why the school at Athens was such an important painting, right? Now, when we look ahead to Bernini, we're not seeing the thought, how am I going to beat this giant, right? The thought is he's in action right now. We're brought right into the scene of action. It is emotionally charged. We're not we're not set back as we watch Michelangelo's David think, but we're there watching this this uh, David who's about ready to throw a no-hitter, right? He's like in this act and there's so much anticipation and there's so much concentration and he's just about ready to let loose. So the time of the High Renaissance is very different than the time of the Baroque, right? The, the High Renaissance is a time when people were focused on thoughtfulness, you might say. During the Baroque, it was the age of um, conquest. You know, the European nations were feeling their oats and were like pushing their culture out beyond the European continent. We don't need this up. Okay. So that was it for painting uh, sculpture for a little while. Back to the diagonal in the paintings of the Baroque period. Here we see a classic painting by Peter Paul Rubens that displays almost all of the elements of Baroque painting. If you notice um, the man up front, if you get too close to him, he's about to elbow you in the gut. You're going to get like, you know, he's, come, he's popping out of the painting over here, right? And we see this whole group of men whose job it is right now is to take that cross and drive it into the ground, right? We see all this musculature, all of it is forcing this, cr this cross into the ground and it creates this strong diagonal from the upper left to the lower right. Right? But there is only one direction, there's only one place where that direction does not hold. And if you look at Jesus' head, it is tilted to the side and his eyes are looking upward. So while there's this powerful directional force driving Jesus down, he's not going to be held by all this massive musculature and he's going to have a different you know, he's going to have a different future. He's looking up to heaven. He's preparing himself for the next phase of his life. And he's also telling everybody looking that these people will not be the end of me, right? My future is beyond them. So Peter Paul Rubens is using directional force and counterbalance in this work to make his point. Ah. Oh. You fast forward 150 years and I can say there's counterbalance, there's directional force, there's this contrast, everything that you would expect to see in a Baroque painting, but what's happening in this painting, right? Come on now. This painting is a late example of the Rococo period, which was the tail end of the French Baroque. And what we're seeing in here is a titillation, a romance, right? This is, uh, we're being voyeurs into this life of the aristocracy, right? And as this young lady is being swung by the, by the, the, the uh, chaperone in the back who's supposed to be, you know, minding her and is actually complicit in this story, she kicks off her shoe and uh, for her suitor and lifts her leg so he can get a little bit of a peek into the volumes of fabric that are beneath the, the, the outer covering, right? It's not like he's going to see anything except lots of fabric, but in his day, that is enough. And what are we seeing here? We're seeing like this whole scene of a frivolous relationship develop where the same structures that were used for such very powerful imagery are being used now by the French aristocracy to show their, you know, their um, interest in pleasure. 
right? Well, the year is 1767, and it's not going to be long before this, this uh, concept of pleasure meets another concept in France. And we look at the oath of the Horatio by Jacques Louis David. And the first thing you notice, man in the middle, very important, holding all of the swords. And where is this set? He's set between this ideal architecture that we've, we've already seen before, right? He's holding the swords of the three men on the left who are his sons. And um, together they form this triangular shape, right? And um, it's very strong, it's very rigid, and it's balanced by some women on the other side. It's contrasted rather by some women on the other side who whereas the men are strong and upright, the women are all, uh, loose and weepy. They're crying because the men are about to go engage in a battle. And they're swearing an oath to their father that they are going to fight, if need be, to the end of their life, right? So there's, there's the possibility of a bad ending. And the women are just unable to stay up strong like the men are as this happens. This is a type of work called neoclassicism. Right? And the neoclassic style uh, is one that was a rebirth of rena high Renaissance styles, which is itself a rebirth of the classical era. So what we're seeing is like a double rebirth going on in 1784. Uh, David makes this painting after going and studying art in Rome for a couple of years as a student. He comes back and this is the painting that he presents as his, if you will, his graduation piece or his masterpiece, right? That would mark him as a master. And it indeed created such a stir that there were lots of followers afterwards that worked in the neoclassical style. Hmm, so what do we have here? Okay, we could have talked a little bit more about neoclassicism, but um, a few decades later, we find ourselves not in, in France or Rome as depicted in France, but in Spain. And the, we see a lot of the ideas of high contrast going here. The painting is divided in half. It's divided along um, what you might say is sympathy and antipathy, right? With the people on the left, we have sympathy for, we can see their faces are, they're in terror. The man is holding out his hands in a, in a posture like Jesus. And then on the other side, what do we see? We see a bunch of Napoleon soldiers, right? And they are aiming down at this man who they are planning to execute. The soldiers have no faces, right? The soldiers are automatons in, you know, they are not, they don't have any humanity. There's no way we can have any sympathy for the cause of Napoleon in this particular work. All of our sympathies lie, uh, Gaia puts all of our sympathies with the Spanish people who are being executed. The story behind this work is that, um, it wasn't painted until five years after the day, 3rd of May, 1808 um, by Goya, but he lived through those dates and it was a period of time in which Spain um, was having some kind of revolutionary difficulties of its own between the royalty and the, 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 the middle and lower class and um, which followed in the footsteps of France, but France had already given up on its revolution and, and had put Napoleon in as emperor, right? So, uh, so there's this whole conflict between the idea of people's revolutions and empires going on here in Goya plainly sides with the, with the people of Spain opposed to, to the empire. This is a work that that uh, that uh, in the 1800s becomes known as Romanticism, right? And we'll look at some works from from that period. 
that might look in a different direction. Delacroix's work painted 20 years later, again, the first thing you should see is the idea of this strong uh, uh, diagonal composition over here. It's even a triangle, but when you look up the triangle, it's a tilted triangle and ready to topple over. And the person at the top of the triangle, the king, has got his head in the dark and is one of the few things that isn't moving in this entire work. Right? Delacroix, it gives us a scene from a, a story that a friend of his had written about an ancient Near Eastern kingdom that was coming to an end. Um, the enemy was at the door and Sardanopolis, the king, was going to destroy all his possessions rather than have his enemies take them. His possessions include women, valuables, animals, and he's going to liquidate everything so that um, enemies can't get it, right? Um, in this work, Delacroix doesn't want us to feel sympathy for this king, obviously, but he doesn't even want us to feel sympathy for the opposing forces that are coming in. They're not liberators, right? They're run by another patriarch and Either way, these people would be suffering, right? And so what Delacroix is really saying to us is the, 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 the um, office of kingship is really the thing that's the problem. You know, the, the history of France up to this date is it's in its second empire, right? Uh, Napoleon was deposed and the king was reposed and then chaos ensued after that as well too. So um, um, he's not painting a good picture of kingdoms uh, here. And, and uh, if you look at the figures, they are all full of these curving, arcing motions that give us a sense of turmoil and activity along with the diagonal composition. We know that something is going to change. And for Delacroix, the idea is that the thing that has to change is the office of king has to be taken away and democracy has to replace it. Well, let's come to a place where there is democracy, uh, at least that sometimes there is democracy, right? And I better not go there <laughs> right now. But uh, there's a whole different story being told. And again, you know, look at that composition. The first thing you're seeing is a strong diagonal, right? And uh, you see a contrast of near and far, right? The near is wild and the far is tamed, right? The wildness represents the parts of the nation in 1836 that have been untamed, right? The, the other part is actually pastoral land. If you look very carefully all the way down here, you can see a little image of the painter himself. And he says, well, I'm pretty meaningless in this whole composition, right? There's a, there's a big drama going on that, does not, that I'm not part of. And one of the ideas of romanticism is that, the, that humanity, which has gotten so full of itself that it thinks it could conquer nature, is not quite to that point yet. That's the story of Frankenstein, right? And here we see if we follow this image upward along the diagonal, does like Rubens does, and it curves back in. What's, what's curving back in? It's like a giant cloud is about to crash on, on the cultivated lands. So Thomas Cole is giving us an image that tells us, well, we are maybe... Uh, humanity at this point is not quite in control of nature, right? That that's not the um, that's not the way we uh, we should think about ourselves in the world, which is a romantic idea. Well, around the same time or shortly before that, we see a, an image that comes from Japan. Hokusai created a whole series of works that were ostensibly about that mountain in the back, Mount Fiji. Mount Fuji, right, which is believed to be the navel of Japan. Everything has sprung from that navel. But the scenes were all daily lives of the Japanese people, and in every one of them in the background, you saw the mountain. But the action going on in the foreground is pretty powerful, right? And we see a group of, of, of 
fishermen out on their boats in water that is much more strong than they, than they care to be in. And uh, we see the power of nature. What's really interesting about this work when you look at the composition is that it's almost like the background, the sky in the background is the exact opposite of the foreground. And together you follow, they create spirals that kind of spiral around in each other, which is this di idea of a dynamic equilibrium between the object and the space, right? Which was very prominent in the work of Japan, right? And there's only one still point in this scene of, of tumult. And that of course is the mountain in the background, which is that triangular form that is um, so very stable. We might get to see that again in a moment. Well, that nothingness, as I mentioned before, is very important in the work uh, you know, of Asian artists. And here we can see two actions happening. We can see the repetition of these cranes and we can see them all pointing in the same direction. And as we follow everything, what does it take us to? It takes us to the nothing, right? Which has always been a concept that has been uh, popular in, in Asia. So here we have, uh, in the last two works, we see the forces of nature in, in action and balanced by the idea of potential. But, you know, that's not the way it always is in in Asia. And here we see a portrait of Emperor Hong Chi. Now, this man is an emperor. And if you notice, he, he's very symmetrical. He creates a stable triangle, much like Jesus did, right, in his painting. And, um, Sorry, these are all people trying to get in that, that caused my attention to waver. Right. So uh, what do we see? We see this emperor. He's a solid triangle. There's no way you're going to knock him over. But he's also doing something else. He's protecting us from what's behind him. And what do you see behind him? You see a dragon. Right. The dragon is the symbol of nature in, in China. And that dragon is always depicted in an asymmetrical fashion, right? So here we see uh, the dragon, he's asymmetrical, and, he, and the emperor is actually wearing a robe that has other dragons in it. And he's telling us in this work that I got you, I got your back, right? I'm in charge here. And you may think that nature is going to harm you, uh, but no, I've got you, right? I am the grand protector of all things in this empire. Right? I am more powerful than, than even nature. And that's the view that he's trying to give us. He does this through his symmetrical um, uh, uh, composition here. Well, this idea of balance and stability is one that is seen throughout the world, right? up to the United States when we look at the White House, right? Here we see a building that is supposed to, when it was made, tell us that, don't worry, I got your back. Everything is gonna be secure because the people in here are in charge. They give us a balanced symmetrical composition. There's no difference from the right or the left. It's very stable and, um, right? It was meant to communicate something to the people of the United States, that the people who live in this building are going to take good care of us. Now, you may think that I just threw that in there because of the current situation, but this has been part of my lecture for close to 20 years. Through all sorts of different presidents, I have shown the White House as a symbol of of the idea of communicating stability through through symmetry. Right? I think I'm going to skip the next work because I think I only have time for one more and I could talk a lot about the starry night. And maybe I'll do that in another, in another session. But what I wanna do is end here since I'm just about out of time with this work from Picasso. Right? Um, 
Picasso uh, made this painting in 1937. It was one of his very few acts of uh, paintings of uh, political import. But when he made it, he was writhing from the bombing of the town of Guernica. As a Spaniard, he saw it as a terrible inhumanity and injustice performed by a government, the, the current government of Spain, on the people of Spain, the destruction of the city of Guernica, right? And um, in, especially since uh, historically this scene, uh, the bombing of Guernica was one in which uh, Franco, General Franco had asked for Mussolini and Hitler to come and help him squash the, squash the, um, the, uh, the people who were fighting against his government. His government wasn't a long-standing government. He had just taken over in a civil war, right? And deposed a republic. So the republic was still fighting against a, a fascist-led government by Franco, who hexed Hitler and Mussolini to come in and help him. Hitler decides that this is an excellent opportunity to practice something that he was going, you know, he was planning on using and then did use first in Poland and then throughout Europe, which was called Blitzkrieg. So Guernica is an omen of Blitzkrieg, which was going to be happening within a couple of years. But when we look at this painting from Picasso's point of view and get rid of that idea of what was going to happen in World War II because it hadn't happened yet, we we get to see a painting where there's all of these fractured forms. And of course, those fractured forms, um, some represent people, some represent um, architecture, some represent, um, you know, the creatures of the world, but all of them are fractured, right? Now, he's seeing this as a world coming, coming apart. But in all of that, he does give us a very strong composition centered on a triangle that is incredibly stable in here, right? We ha and if you could actually see into this area, there are lines that go across there that you could see in the actual work. So he's creating a balanced composition, one that we usually think of as showing us a sense of stability. But in Picasso's work, this piece, right, it does show us something that is going to endure, but it is not the peace and tranquility that we saw in Leonardo's Last Supper. What we're seeing is the endurance, and it's a very pessimistic idea. Picasso was seeing the endurance of humanity's um, ability to inflict pain and suffering onto itself, right? And, uh, I guess that is where I can end today. I have a couple of others that I wanted to talk to you about. It's a good thing I got two more talks, right? So next week, I'm going to be talking to you about non-objective art, how it developed, and how we can how we can get messages from works that we might think are simply of um, uh, shapes and colors. And I want to thank you all for being here. I had a lot of fun. It was so much better than last time. Thank you all for, for sticking it out. And those of you who were here last week know how much, how difficult it was to get started. And I'll be back next week. So I hope to see you all. Thank you. How about I do this for a second? Can I unmute everybody for a second? Is that possible? <laughs> I don't know how to do that. That's for next week. Then you go all say goodbye. But uh Bye, John. Okay, there are some people in there. Hey Bob! <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> I didn't know I'd see you out there today. Bob lives in oh, in faraway Staten oh, Island. Right. Okay. Well done. Well done. What's that? And Bob, well I, I actually I charged Bob with it with us with a, a something that he should be doing on on uh, Facebook, and I asked him if he would do a reading of the Lord of the Rings since he's reading it again. <laughs> I think it's time for somebody to read that book out loud. <laughs> and maybe, Bob is going to give it a look. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we can get him to do. Do I inflict that upon? All right, thanks. Okay, thank you all. Have a great day. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks, John. Okay. Goodbye, Eileen. Hi.
did you were you able to get in? I, I I invited you in about three times. Oh, okay. No, I I I did get in. Yeah, was oh. does that you must have got popped out a couple of times? Yeah, sorry about that. Does that uh, mess you up? I thought that the thing didn't well, automatically. Well, there's a place where it says to admit, and I, and if you ever hear me pausing during my talk, I'm admitting somebody, but it's not that bad because I need a break every now and then. <laughs> I'm not used to talking for an hour straight. When I do these talks, I'm usually in front of a live audience, and um, I do ask questions, and I do see feedback from people's faces and you know the words that they use. So it's not it's not what my familiar routine to be running on for an hour without um, having input from the people around me. So, uh, something Thanks. new for me. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you all next week. Hi. Oh, goodbye. And Bye. Joanne. Joanne, you out there? You're muted on your end. Hi, Joanne. Oh, um I'm here. Bye. <laughs> Joanne is Joanne has been in in a number of my past talks over the years. I think of her as my like my biggest fan. You know, I am. I just love. He has it. fun, I'm... and that's good, and that's what counts. <laughs> my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all, Bob and Jeff. I don't think I've I've met you before, I'm but thank you. Thank, thank you for you, being John. here. I might have, you know, but no one is no one is wearing their nice clothes today. So, uh, or some of you aren't anyway. I am. I always dress up for these. I put on a shirt. Yeah. Okay, all. So I'm going to tune out now. I'm going to have lunch, and I have another class with my Nassau students in 55 minutes. So, be well, everybody. I'll see you next week.